My name is Mary Beth Bergeron. I'm the Vice Chairman of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts, and on behalf of the Board of Directors, we welcome you. Our speakers tonight are State Senator Eric Lesser. He represents the 1st Hamden and Hampshire District since 2015. After serving as Ground Logistics Coordinator for Barack Obama, 2008 presidential campaign, he became the special assistant, assistant to David Axelrod, senior advisor to the president. Lesser also worked as, at the Council of Economic Advisors and the White House unit charged with offering the president objective economic advice. His, his actual resume is much longer than that. <laughs> Dr. Joshua Weiss, Hmm? <laughs> yeah, we can only fit so much in this space. He is the program director for Bay Path University's Master of Science in Leadership and Negotiation. He is a senior fellow at the Harvard Negotiation Project, a subsidiary of Harvard University's program on negotiation. In addition, he is the founder of no Negotiation Works, Inc., consulting for a number of Fortune 500 companies, the United Nations, and the U.S. government. Josh, again, is also a member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council. So even if you're never in a position to have to negotiate on an international scale, all of us negotiate, negotiate daily in our lives, whether it be in our companies or with our spouses or with our children. So hopefully they'll have some really great ideas for us on how to succeed at the negotiation table. So Josh, please take it away. So thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to share a little with us. And uh, the format is that uh, Senator Lesser and I are going to talk a little bit. I've got some questions for him to kind of get us moving. And then um, after a little bit, we'll open it up. And I'm sure you have plenty of questions about what's happening globally and um, how that impacts Western Mass as well. So um, thanks again for coming. Yeah. And uh, you know, you spent quite a few years in the Obama White House. One of the things that Obama was trying to do in his Obama doctrine, if you believe there was an Obama doctrine, was to kind of shift U.S. policy from the Middle East in many ways uh, toward Asia and seeing um, some challenges and other you know, questions that were arising. Um, and so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about his strategy in doing that and you know, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the idea behind that and what, you know, what he was trying to accomplish as well as those of you who are working closely yeah. with him. <clears throat> well, thanks, Josh, for having me. And I, I've got so many friends in the audience. I will, um, I'll get in trouble if I start acknowledging people. But I do <laughs> want to um, thank the World Affairs Council and give a round of applause to Sid uh, for her help in getting the event uh, set up tonight. We appreciate it. And um, I, I'm always a fan of kind of recognizing and lifting up kind of young people. And um, there is one young person who I've known since she was young, uh, and that's, uh, um, uh, is Julia Pupolo still here? Uh, Angelo's daughter, but uh, she's, a, she's a junior at Wilbraham and Munson, and we're very proud of her. So uh, I definitely want to give her, uh, give her a shout out and uh, an acknowledgement. Um, I was with her dad yesterday for a big uh -huh. portion of the day. So. Uh -huh. uh, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think to... What I want to do is just zoom everyone back a little bit for some of the context on President Obama or then really Senator Obama and how he got started. One of the things he was kind of attacked for in the beginning was his relative lack of experience um, and his relative lack of accomplishment or, um, or sort of uh, exposure to international affairs. And if you remember, the context of this was he was running in 2008 in the primary against Hillary Clinton, who had been a mm -hmm. former, uh, former first lady and had been the you know, senator from New York and obviously had a major global uh, named attached to her and John McCain, who right. was one of you know probably the the highest profile member of the u s Senate when it came to foreign affairs and had his own storied history in foreign policy but at the core of uh, obama 's message, I actually think it ended up being very prescient, which was mm -hmm. that American policy had become too focused on the Middle East uh, and had become too bogged down in particular at that time in the war in Iraq that we had forgotten and taken our focus off these slower burning but ultimately much bigger systemic changes that were happening around the world, principally climate change and the international response to climate change and the rise of Asia, in particular mm -hmm. uh, the rise of China. So 
in, two, in August of 2007, he laid all this out in a speech that, for nerds like us, has become famous. I don't think mm -hmm. most people uh, know about this, but in uh, August of 2007, he gave a kind of major speech where he kind of laid out his vision on foreign policy that I was involved in preparing for. Uh, and he made kind of two main arguments. Uh, one was he wanted to scale down the war in Iraq and scale up the effort in Afghanistan to focus on counterterrorism and to actually go after bin Laden. And um, he made big news when he did this because one of the things he said was um, if he had actionable intelligence uh, about, uh, about, uh, you know, about bin Laden being in Pakistan, he would violate the alliance with Pakistan and he would go into Pakistan to take out bin Laden. And when he said this in this speech, he was, com he was attacked by the foreign policy community as that being naive, you could never do that, you would trigger World War III. A couple years later, that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. And then the other major element of that speech was about part of the reason we, need to, we needed to scale down in Iraq was so that we could scale up our engagements in Asia. Um, and so um, that ultimately meant economic engagements, things like TPP, uh, but it also meant cooperation with them uh, around a global system, around things like climate change, um, things like anti-piracy efforts, uh, cyber terrorism, cyber security that are kind of pan-national in their approach that needed to be dealt with. And the other um, very important thing and the sort of umbrella approach to all this was setting up structures in place and institutions that would manage the emergence that he saw of a kind of bipolar world. Mm -hmm. Because once China is equal or even more powerful than us, we're going to hope that there are institutions that keep China acting responsibly like NATO and like uh, the G20 and like uh, the UN and like the WTO. So the theory was bring them in now mm -hmm build norms of behavior so that they'll cooperate so that eventually when that, uh, you know, when that, when or if that eclipse does happen, um, America is going to be uh, on the cooperative, so on the, on the, on the uh, okay end of that bargain. Yeah, so can you say another a word also about the TPP? I, I don't know how much folks know about, the, about yeah. it, but the purpose behind it and, you know, it's now sort of defunct um, yeah. for the moment at least, um, but I think the idea behind it was an interesting one, uh, and I think fits in with what you were talking about. Yeah, so I mean, it's controversial. It was. It became very controversial domestically. You know, you had both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump uh, trashing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, that that There's was probably kinda, something in right? there that was right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, there, there's a lot to it that's very, di uh, you know is difficult uh, domestically um, mm -hmm. and you know and actually we should have a conversation about that but the idea behind TPP was to create a, you know a partnership of nations basically around China that actually had even more to lose from uh, from China's rise than the US so right. you know the countries that were in TPP were Vietnam you know um, uh, Malaysia Australia you know, Asian countries that were on the periphery or on the borders of China that wanted the U.S.'s help, you know, to create a system, you know, not dissimilar from NAFTA to, you know, bind those countries together culturally, economically, and, and ultimately strategically there was a security component to that mm -hmm. to sort of manage the integration of China uh, into a global system. And it was, it was, there are a lot of problems with TPP and, uh, you know, we, we can get into that, but I think something that gets lost in the debate is the strategic importance of how it plays into U.S. sort of, um, you know, uh, defense policy, frankly, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it was about managing China uh, and creating a system of nations to, uh, to, manage, to manage China. And lo and behold, as soon as, T as um, the U.S. withdrew <coughs> from TPP, those countries got together and announced that they were continuing with that trading bloc anyway mm -hmm. uh, because they still had the same interest in working together on a common market uh, to pr create negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis China. And do you know, how is that, is that continuing, is it moving along and is it it's actually? It's done, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, yeah. As, uh, as, yeah, as, I mean, as soon as the, the, the U.S., as right. soon as Trump said uh, we're pulling out, I mean, they, they basically got together and said, okay, fine, right. uh, we're, we're, we're moving forward. I was actually at, I, I, I worked, um, 
uh, when I was working for uh, Ax Axelrod, I took a break for about 10 days or so mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and flew to Yokohama uh, with, the, with the sort of U.S. White House advance team that was helping set up President Obama's visit to the APEC conference in Yokohama, Japan in, mm -hmm. in the f late fall, early winter of 2010. And it was actually at that conference in Yokohama, Japan, that Hillary Clinton announced you know, the formation of the negotiating team for, mm -hmm. uh, for TPP. So it ended up being a very, uh, very important, um, uh, very important um, announcement. And again, it was at the APAC conference. So the, 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 the idea of that was um, very deliberate in terms of taking U.S. allies that were in Asia and linking them together, um, uh, you know, even more intense, intently. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's fair to say as we look globally, we see a lot of dr fairly dramatic shifts from sort of liberal democracies <laughs> to more populist conservative regimes, whether it's, you know, sort of the movement in the UK with Brexit, and who knows what, what's going to happen with that, to much more conservative governments in Hungary and Poland and Brazil and other places. Um, I'm curious, sort of, what do you make of the shift? Like, why do you think this is transpiring? Uh, I mean, actually, to bring it back to the TPP conversation, uh -huh. it's, you know, they're all related. Uh, you know, I, you know, Dawn's here from AIM. I mean, she knows about the issues with manufacturing policy and job creation better than anyone. But, um, you know, the, all of these things I actually think are connected. And we're here in, in, in Western Mass, specifically in Springfield. You know, globalization has opened up quite a lot of opportunities for people, um, but has also hurt a lot of communities. And it's hurt mm -hmm. Western Mass, you know. Um, in Springfield, you can think about just off the top of our head, the home of Indian motorcycles, American Bosch, Westinghouse, Duryea, mm -hmm. Uniroyal, you go on and on and on down the line of, you know, of, of big industrial manufacturing bases that left Western Mass. First they went south, then they went mm -hmm. overseas, now are largely in Mexico or Asia. That's just a fact. That's not a political right. talking point. That's just the facts of what happened in this country over 50 years. Places like Boston or Pittsburgh, even um, that have <clears throat> institutions and had um, universities to manage that transition, have backfilled that job loss with you know jobs in healthcare, jobs in education, jobs in high tech fields. So they've been blunted from some of the impact. But communities like Western Mass have not had that same. I mean, we've we've worked on trying to to bridge that, but have not did not have that same backfill, and so mm -hmm. there's a lot of resentment. I represent a lot of families. I get these calls every single day mm -hmm. uh, of people who worked at Westinghouse or worked at um, you know American Bosch or worked at Uniroyal, whose kids are working at Home Depot for eleven dollars or twelve dollars an hour. So mm -hmm. um, you know, shame <clears throat> on. Uh, policymakers for ignoring that, I think, for as long as they did. And this isn't a problem actually even unique to the U.S. The whole, every Western economy is facing this. Mm -hmm. And there are constructive ways we can respond to it. I, I personally think things like investing in infrastructure, you know, that's why I talk about high-speed rail so much. Mm -hmm. uh, things like investing in universal college education, job training, again, trying to backfill those positions with new jobs that, that pay better and, and are better working conditions and provide people better uh, quality of life. That's the way to go. But if mm -hmm. you don't do that, we shouldn't be shocked when there's a backlash. And, and that backlash can also take a very dark turn. And I think that's what's happened. I mean, I consider basically them all being variations on the same theme, the election of Trump <clears throat> in the U.S., Brexit in England, um, the, even the rise of Le Pen or, uh, you know, in France or mm -hmm. the... Um, the new the vest movement that's going on in right. France, the 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 victory of Oban in Hungary, um, you know, down the line are all variations on the same issue, which is that if you if people feel ignored from their government and they feel like a transition and a change that is coming at their expense, um, you're you're gonna you're gonna see consequences, and I think that's what you're seeing. And the, I mean, and that's been a, happening over a period of time that. You know where you know globalization, and you've got places where there's cheaper labor, and and some of these forces that have taken over. And the, part of the question is, you know, it is a difficult change to think about. How do you, for folks who feel left behind, and maybe who don't have skill sets that are still, um, you know, capable of them doing something that's going to have the kind of life that their parents had or their parents before them had? Um, and so it is a difficult question about how you 
you know, help some of those folks to make the shift and bring them along with where the world is headed. Yeah. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, some of this is, uh, and I do my own reflecting on this, but mm -hmm. um, I do think that there is some truth to the fact that, you know, the elite world, ha a lot of the pain of, of globalization has been invisible. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. I mean, I, you know, I was, I, when I, when I was uh, undergrad at Harvard, I took the Act 10, you know, the, the sort of, the sort of um, canonical or sort of like uh, class you take in economics your first freshman year is called Act 10. It's like mm -hmm. this survey class. It's taught by Greg Mankiw, who's, uh, you know, who was a, a Reagan, a Ray, Ronald Reagan's economic advisor and, um, and, a, and another guy, Marty Feldstein, who was the uh, head of Reagan's uh, Council on Economic Advisors. And, you know, two mm -hmm. of the biggest names in economics. But, you know, at the end of a class like that, you would you would think that globalization was, you know, an an, an inevitable, unrivaled good, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and there's a lot of in a lot of respects it is good, um, but in a lot of respects it's created a lot of challenges that I think went unrecognized and unacknowledged for too long, mm -hmm. um, and um, and you know I just what I'm most familiar with is Massachusetts, right? Because I. I'm in the in the Senate in, in Massachusetts, and it's easy to think about this in an abstract intellectual way. But we have the same challenge in Massachusetts that you have nationally in the whole U.S. or even globally when we talk about England or or, mm. or other places. You know, if you take Bo like Boston has experienced double-digit growth um, for a while now, you mm -hmm. know, almost a generation, and the overall mm -hmm. Massachusetts economy looks very very good. By only any every by basically every measure, income growth, unemployment rates, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But if you take Boston and the greater Boston area out, mm -hmm. our economy is actually much similar to Michigan or Ohio or Wisconsin in terms of growth rates, aging workforce, some of the challenges that get talked about on the wall in the Wall Street Journal and about Michigan. Yep. And uh, and um, and England is the same. If you take London out. Mm -hmm. You know, Manchester, Birmingham, Northern England have seen those same, uh, you know, have seen those same erosions. So the question is, is like, okay, you know, we can continue to just take as gospel that Boston is going to grow, you know, um, as a boomtown forever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I personally think that ultimately that's going to that's going to be bad for Boston, um, and it's definitely not good for us. <laughs> So how do you how do you figure out a way to make that growth spread out a little bit more and to give uh, you know more people access to that that opportunity and you know quite frankly I think in many ways the Trump election could have been avoided um, if uh, if um, if policymakers were more attuned to that much earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, so let me pick up on the on that last point and talk about something you've been involved with quite a bit the East West Rail Link. Um, when you and I have talked about this in the past, you said that you've learned um, from some places internationally about the importance of this, and in particular what you were just talking about of bringing some of those opportunities to Lowell, Worcester, Springfield, Holyoke, et cetera. So what did, what did you learn from those places when you were sort of studying this and looking at it? Yeah, I mean, again, like um, we are a unique place, but, but our challenges are not unique. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt lucky in the sense that I had perspective because I worked on economic policy for President Obama. So by definition, you're looking at the whole country and really the whole world. When I was working at the Council on Economic Advisors, I was the only person in the whole team that didn't have a PhD in economics, which was great, by the way. <laughs> they, they, uh, um, he learned a lot. But uh, um, you know, one of the things that we looked at was industrial policy and, um, and uh, actually looking at other countries and what they've done. And again, England, Every advanced economy is facing a version of what we've been facing, which is a hollowing out of an industrial base, the decline in purchasing power of people who work with their hands, uh, and a hyper concentration <clears throat> of growth and wealth in a handful of knowledge centers. You know, um, the San Francisco's, the Paris's, the, um, the, the Boston's, the London's, um, really at the expense and the detriment to everywhere else. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, in the UK, they have an entire industrial policy now centered around rail service, um, connecting through high speed rail links the northern industrial cities of, you know, Liverpool, Manchester, et cetera, you know, to the central uh, London hunt. Spain has done this. Um, you know, they've connected Barcelona to Madrid. 
on a on a you know a, a hyper fast line that now has offshoots at small cities along the way that used to you know be major centers of industry, um, and uh, and uh, and in the U.S. you know you look at Portland, Maine, right? Mm -hmm. You know even just to take New England as an example, about the same distance from Boston as Springfield is. Mm -hmm. Portland, Maine, <clears throat> 10, 15 years ago. Was was a was a was a beat up fishing town. You know when the when the when the fishing industry left, it was in tough shape. Mm -hmm. They expanded, uh, um, you know, down Easter uh, rail service. They expanded the Amtrak service. They used the, They did a cooperative agreement. Maine was actually paying Massachusetts to help um, to help mm -hmm. uh, you know juice the train service between the two places. And Portland now is a completely different place. Yeah. Uh, from where it was, you know, even even 10, 10 12 uh, years ago. Um, but it can't it can't be done in a vacuum. It has to be done in in um, each location needs assets and investments that are inherent to what gives them a compar comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. So, like in Western Mass, for example, um, we're very strong in advanced manufacturing. Uh, because we were the home of all these places, and we still have Smith and Wesson, and we have this really, we had the armory here, and we have this very strong manufacturing tradition. So let's build upon that by doing next wave manufacturing. So things like, um, you know, 3D printing, the the uh, manufacturing of advanced wind turbines, of components of solar panels, you know. Um, and, and, and that requires, um, you know, folks to come out of places like Stick or Putnam or Chicopee Comp. Uh, or HCC with you know with with real skills not in how to mechanically operate a machine but how to do the programming to operate a machine that does the work mm -hmm. um, and so to do that you need to beef up training you need the training to be more iterative and flexible you need it to be affordable for people who are working at these factories or for businesses to provide it you know um, you need really close integration between um, uh, the employers and the trainers, because the training, the the uh, relevancy of the different things that they're learning changes as the software changes and as the machines change. So you do that in coordination with rail policy. Not only do you put a lot of people to work making the train, making the rail, and building the rail beds, but now all of a sudden you're building an ecosystem here. So someone who is an MIT engineer who's designing the products can get here easily to supervise a factory that makes the products and all of a sudden now you're much more cost competitive with China or Malaysia to make the same thing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's all integrated, but again, infrastructure I do think really is the key mm -hmm. uh, because we've let our infrastructure deteriorate in this country for a long time. You know, and you and I have talked about China. China, for example, has more uh, high-speed rail under construction than our than rail lines in the entire rest of the world combined. Hmm. So mm. um, I, 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 the way I <clears throat> kind of talk about this is um, an American visiting China now is probably what like a British person or a European visiting the U.S. in the 1950s felt. Mm -hmm. Because you know a, a, a European visiting America in the 1950s would have seen millions of people going to school on the GI Bill. They would have seen construction of interstate highways all over the place. They would have seen you know huge new developments of affordable housing for people to be moving into with their families, new appliances, you know, really the future. Um, and mm -hmm. now Americans have to go to Asia uh, to see the future. And, um, and, uh, and I think we need more vision and ambition uh, about what we need to be doing here to maintain that edge. And, mm -hmm. and I, don't, I don't see that happening right now. Well, that kind of brings me to a, kind of a question that maybe will be the last one, and then we can open it up, which will hopefully... Rambling a little hopefully, bit. No, 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 <laughs> hopefully, but, but hopefully be a bridge to kind of the current present day. Um, when you look out at, at some of the, the foreign policy that, that exists now, where do you think we are doing a good job? Where is there a policy that, um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> that, that you, you, know, you kind of support, and then um, there may be some others that perhaps aren't? as well um, I mean, formulated. American foreign <laughs> policy right now is completely self-destructive. Uh, the, 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 um, the means are very important in foreign policy because you know, if you burn bridges and, and, and destroy relationships with your allies, even if, the, even if the ultimate objective is maybe right or maybe the right thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, the, the process is almost as important as the outcome. Sure. And that's been lost, I think. <clears throat> in this in this current environment, I mean, just run through a couple of examples. I mean, 
I do think we need to get tough with China on intellectual property enforcement, on, on, on trade protection. Mm -hmm. I do think when you just look at it factually, this is an opinion, the, there is an imbalance there in terms of, you know, they require American companies to set up these, you know, these, um, uh, these joint ventures right. with Chinese firms. We don't have anything remotely equivalent to that when a Chinese company comes and does business in the U.S. Like, that's not fair. Yep. That needs to be sorted out. The rampant piracy issues, the IP issues. But you know what? Like, just screaming at them and insulting everyone and breaking down, again, this is about the institutions thing where I was saying with Obama, you've got to work through the institutions. Every other country in, on earth has this gripe with China. Right. So why wouldn't we go to Australia and Canada and New Zealand and France and England and say, and India, right. work with us, let's all work together and go to them collectively because you know, China is getting to be a pretty big economy. And if, they, and if the fight is U.S. versus China, well, they're going to go to Africa, they're going to go to Latin America, they're going to go to Southeast Asia, and they're going to build their own alliances. But if we get in front of it and say to the Indians, you know, who are a democracy just like us, are a huge growing economy, have mm -hmm. their own issues with China that they, that they want to challenge and say, you know, work with us on the IP protections that your software f companies are suffering from just like ours, we're going to speak yeah. with a lot more uh, with a, with a lot more authority. I mean, another one, the uh, you know the, the the way the pullout was announced in Syria. I mean, I, I was against the war in Iraq. I, I I think America should be focusing on 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 you know less on a war posture. I mean, I I, I ultimately think we do need to get out of Syria. But why would you do this in a way that um, you know that throws the Kurds? under the bus who have been a steadfast American ally, mm -hmm. you know, going back to, you know, to, to enforcing no-fly zones against Saddam Hussein. I mean, yeah. you know, one day we're going to need them, you know, for the next, for the next issue. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think that the processes, you know, it's, it's very fashionable now to destroy and tear down institutions mm -hmm. um, because, again, I think there's a lot of anger at institutions for the blind spots that the leaders of a lot of those institutions have had with <clears throat> the real suffering of people you know, in our country. And so I think, um, mm -hmm. and I think, but I think the response to that is not to just tear them down and, you know, run like a bull through a China right. shop. It's to rebuild those institutions and to update them so that they're inclusive of people's genuine concerns but are going about the ultimate aims in a constructive way. Yeah. I think it's very much, I mean, I agree that it's very much the how that, that things are happening that I think is most troubling. Um, and I was actually in Ethiopia in September and the Chinese are already well established across Africa and, and the funding of lots of buildings that are quote unquote gifts that are not supposed to have any right. um, strings, but um, they're strings. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I think that <clears throat> in, in many ways our pulling back from the world has enabled um, that kind of thing to transpire and sort of open it up. You know, when there's a vacuum, you don't know what ends up happening. You know, after the Arab Spring, there was a vacuum. Governments, you know, d fledgling democratic entities didn't step in, so you got more extreme entities that, that came along. So let me pause there, and uh, I'm guessing there are a few questions out there in the crowd, and so let me go ahead and open it up, and we'll uh, see what we get. Sir? So how do you solve <coughs> the problems we talked about in Massachusetts, the country in the world, <laughs> somehow decrease the ever-widening gap between those who have and those who have not. Because you, you suppress people long enough, you piss them off, and you, and you have everything that's happened in France, etc. So unless you solve that problem somehow, I mean, I think that's the ball game. I mean, I think that's the that's the the central issue that's under that's underpinning all the instability. I mean, look, we you know just. You know, people have probably seen there's multiple reports now that 40 percent of jobs have the potential to be impacted or eliminated through automation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we haven't faced a transition like that since, you know, the, the invention of the cotton gin, right? Like, I mean, th th this is, a, a, cha this is a, a change and a disruption in our economy that, is, that has been unmatched in a century. So um, I, I tend to think that a lot of the insecurity and instability in our politics is people struggling to respond to what they kind of know in their kishkas, which is, is that there's an imbalance in how the economy um, is working now. Uh, and you, again, there's inequality in every way. You know, we talk about the statistical sort of atmospheric inequality, the numbers, you know, 
forty percent of the wealth is in the top one percent, and 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 all of that, and and that has to change. And uh, I I don't think I, I mean the next president will be someone who speaks effectively, and proactively to how to address that change. But the other thing I would just point out is that's papered on top of even gross, even more extreme disparities along racial lines, uh, along um, you know uh, um, uh, along uh, um, you know sort of creed and ethnic lines, and also along geography. Uh, and um, you know we have a big problem in New England and in Massachusetts with regional disparity. You know, um, four of the five poorest counties in Massachusetts are in Western Mass. And if you again, like I'm going to repeat this, but if you take the, the 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 495 Boston core out. We are the Midwest, you know, and and uh, and I'm saying that from a place of love. Like this is where I live. So, you know, we 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 need you know tinkering around the edges, and and marginal uh, you know marginal recommendations on you know we need a little bit more for this training program and we need a little more more for that. I I, I don't think people have patience for it anymore because they know. That the situation is on the scale of what we <clears> faced, <throat> you know, when there was a progressive movement in the early 1900s with trust busting, when there was a, when there was a New Deal to create universal um, social insurance, which, by the way, was attacked as some sort of socialist ploy when it was proposed by FDR. So, you know, we need, and this is why I'm excited about things like the Green New Deal and like you know other conversations that are happening. Is is if the conversation stays constructive. Um, it's going to be zeroed in on exactly your point, which is the you know the inequality. I, I would just add that I think one of the problems that I see that seems to happen over and over again is there's a quote by H. L. Mencken who said, "For every complex problem, there's a simple, clear, concise answer that's wrong." <laughs> and it's a you know, and I think in part you know people want solutions, um, but they're often given solutions that really aren't realistic and they're not going to address the problem. Like we have to face the hard facts of some of these challenges and say let's let's not tell people what they want to hear. Let's let's really dig in and talk about what's the solution to something like this that that it actually will work and not just be a palliative kind of solution. So um, here and then over there. Senator, Dave. I <laughs> Yeah. So I mean, this is kind of part of what we're talking about. So um, you know, I view this as a complement to the rail initiative. Uh, but the idea is, is you know, you've got a lot of people who are just burned out with the grind in Boston and in New York, uh, and uh, and a lot of people who are in jobs that don't really require them to be in an office every day. You know, if you're working in, uh, you know, computer programming or graphic design, you can work remotely. You can tell you can teleconference. You know, Skype is you know better than ever, and FaceTime and everything else. So um, to me, it feels almost like a win-win for everyone. You know, we've got a lot. You know, one out of ten homes in our gateway cities in Western Mass are vacant. Yeah, there's a Mass Inc. report that just came mm. out. We have a whole um, a neighborhood stabilization initiative that I'm a part of as chair of our Gateway Cities Caucus, which is the um, legislators that come from the Gateway Cities, Lawrence, Lowell, Springfield, Holyoke, Chicopee, mm. Pittsfield, you know, basically the, 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 the former industrial centers outside of Boston. And actually, if you take all those communities and you survey the housing, the, the, va the vacancies, one out of ten wow. housing units in those communities are right now vacant. So, you know, the conversation around housing is often focused on the gentrification issues in Boston, and, and those are very important issues and not minimizing them. But we need to zoom out and look at what the whole state is facing. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of our communities, we have a lot of uh, excess capacity and a lot of great opportunities to transform abandoned mills into co-working spaces and to <coughs> revitalize neighborhoods with new, with new folks. Also, our communities are aging in Western Mass and our workforce is aging. That's putting pressure on looking at the senior, you know, putting pressure on the on, on, on senior centers and healthcare services. We need more young people, we need more young families, we need more homeowners. So if you've got someone who's working at Fidelity mm -hmm. and is, you know, sick of sitting in an hour of traffic every day to go four miles, you know, from their house to the seaport, and they don't really need to be there anyway mm -hmm. because they could do it remotely. Well, let's give them ten thousand dollars to hire a moving company, bring them out here, 
um, you know, retrofit a, uh, a bedroom in the house with, uh, you know, really good high tech, you know, video conferencing equipment. And, you know, maybe once a month or twice a month for their, you know, for their big, for their big management meetings, they need to go in. But they're going to be making a fidelity salary living in Western Mass. Like, mm -hmm. they're going to live like a king. And by the way, that's more, t more property taxes for us. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's someone spending money in local restaurants and at local stores. You know, that's someone with kids in the school system who's going to be invested in the community. Um, and because they're working from home and they're spending less time in the car or pulling their hair out on the MBTA, which is falling apart, um, you know, maybe they can volunteer, spend those hours volunteering or, you know, or, or joining World Affairs Council or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, to me, it feels like a, like a common sense thing. Right. And, and the other thing about the incentive is, is this is short money. I mean, the GE incentive package that brought GE to Fort Point Channel, which, by the way, Fort Point Channel has some of the most expensive real estate in the entire country. It's already a red-hot neighborhood. And they, 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 um, the incentive to get GE to move to Fort Point Channel from Fairfield, Connecticut, by the way, one really wealthy place, Fairfield, Connecticut, to another <coughs> really wealthy place, Fort Point Channel, talking about inequality yeah. and how we exacerbate that. It ends up being more than $150,000 per job created. And by the way, that's not given to the worker. That's given to the company. So that's distributed globally to their shareholders. That doesn't stay in Massachusetts, that mm -hmm. incentive. So if you're giving $10,000 over two years directly to the family and the person, mm -hmm. they're going to spend that money locally. And it's more surgical because if one person does it, you only spend $10,000. If, you know, if 1,000 people do it, then you then then you spend more, and we we set the whole plan up as a ca as a three year pilot with a cap on the total amount in the beginning, so that we can test it, see whether it works. And mm -hmm. um, I I think this has huge potential, um, you know, for Western Mass. And you know, we blatantly copied it from Vermont, mm -hmm. and you know, Vermont <coughs> passed this in July. Mm -hmm. It became law. It became law January one. So you know, we'll have a test case with with what Vermont is mm -hmm. doing. Okay. Yes, sir. So. Mine would be, my question would be twofold. If you're talking about how disruptive all of this is and that we have to face this, did you hear anything in the governor's current budget that addresses everything that you're talking about? So that'd be the first part. But the rail is, is an interesting idea. I don't quite get how we get people moving that quickly from Springfield to Boston because it has to be a straight line rail. It can't be the old 19th century line. <coughs> it has to stop once along the way to maintain speed. And while east-west is great, Berkshire County is in a worse situation than the three western counties, and there's no talk of rail out of Connecticut to Pittsfield, mm -hmm. which would get your New Yorkers yeah. and your Connecticut people in and out of Berkshire County, which needs an influx of population far more desperately than Franklin, Hampshire, Hamden County. So I'm curious about the governor's budget. And then East-West Rail is under a three-year um, survey, which doesn't include any start of construction. It doesn't one year, one year, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, it's, so it's a one-year yeah. study, but it's another year of study mm -hmm. just to get the results before you start the, I mean, East-West Rail sounds like it's 10 to 15 away if all goes well. Well, uh, a lot to unpack. What was your name? Sorry. I'm Chris. Chris, yeah, a lot to unpack there. So <laughs> let, me, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me start with rail and work backwards. But, uh, uh, you know, so you, you just brought up another important point, which is, um, I mean, the, the, amount of, the amount of mobilization and um, <clears throat> teeth we had to pull just to get the study right. is its own commentary mm -hmm. on our state's political system and really how our country even views infrastructure now. I mean, you know, when they would say, oh, well, you know, there's Quabog Hills, it's going to be hard to get the train through. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> they, we, we, there's high-speed rail through the Alps. Right. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, there's like the Rocky Mountains. They, they, yeah, they right. built high-speed rail through, they, they built the Transcontinental Railroad through the Rocky Mountains 150, 200 years ago. <laughs> so um, this is an issue of ambition that we need to you know, really get the word out to the state. Um, in terms of the technical, you know, piece, we have the study ongoing. Um, there, it, it, will, it will hopefully be done by the end of this year. 
Um, <coughs> so the MassDOT is in charge of that feasibility study. They're going to come back to us once that study is done with a kind of game plan and a blueprint for how to make it happen. I'm cautiously optimistic. I do worry that there's a risk of studying it to death. Um, uh, so we're going to keep an eye on it, and we're going to need everyone's help here with keeping an eye on it. Um, you're right about the issues in Berkshire County, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a huge issue, and they, they, their population numbers are, are really scary when you, look at, uh, when you look at the statistics. There is an initiative that a colleague of mine, um, Senator Hines, um, who's the senator from Pittsfield that we worked on, um, to set up, a, it's called the Berkshire Flyer, which would be rail service connecting Pittsfield to New York. Um, which I do think would be important. For them, the New York link is very, very important. Um, is it Pittsfield into New York State? Uh, is it Pittsfield south to south? So I know you're, I mean, we can talk more about this. We could get into a rabbit hole on this. I mean, there's the Housatonic <laughs> line, and there's a line through Connecticut, and I'm very familiar with all this. But I think the line that they're looking at is uh, that his line is, is through Albany into New York City. Um, so, you know, some of it is about they got to now work with New York. If mm -hmm. New York's not cooperative, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, but your, your sort of broader comment about, you know, the challenges in the Berkshires, Franklin County also, the relocation incentive is something <coughs> that we can, you know, that we can start to do to, you know, at least begin to move the needle that would, that would impact everywhere. That's written as all four counties. So, yeah, I mean, look, I would love to have high-speed rail connecting every community in the state. But um, I think what we've seen with the challenges with Springfield is, you know, Springfield really needs this. I feel very strongly about this. You know, it's the third largest city in the state. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's got immense assets. We have a brand new Union Station that's open. We've mm -hmm. got an MGM facility less than a mile from where the train location is. It sits right at the intersection of now new north-south service mm -hmm. Going up into the uh, up into Northampton and Greenfield, <coughs> and going south into Hartford and New Haven, the New Connecticut line into New York. Like it, it, Springfield really needs this. It's time for Springfield to have this rail connection. It, 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 this is the moment for Springfield, and we've got to get that done. It's you know I'm I'm very focused on this. This is what I'm spending you know a, a major portion of my time and energy on because when you think about what would truly be transformative, to go back to the point over there. I can't think of a single thing that would be more impactful for Springfield and for Western Mass than getting that regular rail service. It would transform uh, our, our region. I, you, you, would, you, would, you would see thousands uh, of, of, uh, of new jobs, and, um, and we've, we've got to get that done. And it's been now four years of, uh, of you know, of fighting uh, to make that happen. So you know, my feeling is you know, we cannot lose focus on, on getting that finished. So let me uh, try to get some folks in the back. Um, sir, in the blue jacket? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> since we're talking about negotiations, uh, when Pre uh, President Trump came into office, uh, he felt that there was a need to renegotiate NAFTA. It had been negotiated back in <coughs> 1994. Uh, initial reaction on the part of both uh, Mexico and Canada, no, we don't want to do that. With time, uh, both countries eventually came around and did conduct some negotiations with, with Mexico. And I think of because of the succession, the, the Mexican negotiations, Canada kind of followed suit. So now today, we have the U.S.-Mexican-Canadian agreement. It's been negotiated, not ratified yet. Uh, do you, how did Trump manage to bring about that negotiation, considering the resistance? Yeah. And secondly, now that it's been negotiated, do you think it's been a win-win situation for the three countries involved. I, I, I don't know enough <laughs> about his negotiating strategy or how he operates his, his administration to, to, to answer that for you, so I, I might have to kind of pass on that. Uh, I mean, what I would say is, um, you know, uh, Again, the, you know, in, you know, in, insulting Justin Trudeau, all that craziness, insulting Mexico, the wall. We don't need to go into all that. I don't think that that's a smart strategy uh, for how to work with your two, um, you know, largest and most strategic trading partners and allies on your northern and your southern border. Although, if you just zoom back, I mean, I do think it makes sense to renegotiate elements of NAFTA. You know, the the auto the the auto concessions that were made are going to create jobs, hopefully. Um, and, and there was bipartisan and has been bipartisan um, support for certain elements of that. So we'll see. I mean, 
someone should probably explain to him how um, the system of checks and balances works because this still needs to get through the House and the Senate uh, and then needs to get, give it, get given back to him to sign before it can then actually even be sent to, uh, to Mexico or Canada to ratify. So a lot in this could still change. And actually the guy to probably ask is Richie Neal. Uh, because the chair, the way you know, um, uh, trade agreements go through the Ways and Means Committee, so um, it, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to kind of to kind of still unpack and find out about that. I mean, I would just add, I, you know, I don't think Canada and Mexico really had a choice, um, you know, given the magnitude of the the U.S. economy, when you know Trump said that this is something we want to do, um, it was fairly difficult for them to resist doing it. I think. I do think, like, like Senator Lester said, that there were aspects of it, but I think, I think we're living in an era where things are being taken to an extreme, as opposed to saying, like, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, let's look at some of these things that can be improved. It hasn't been touched since 1994, so there are places to do that. That's reasonable. Again, I think we're back to the how, which is where I usually come back to with this administration, is how you go about it matters. And, um, and so I think, they may have, you know, what I know about it, there have been some improvements on different sides. There are also ramifications when it comes to the steel tariffs and other kinds of pieces that require, um, you know, those countries getting uh, passes essentially from those tariffs. So I think in some regard, the negotiation process um, was something that the U.S. forced on Canada and Mexico. Uh, and again, there are pieces of it that I think were reasonable to talk about, uh, but again, how you do it is, I think, the challenge. Yes? Um, you were talking about Richie Neal, so I'll ask a question to kind of incorporate him, but I know you have a close relationship with him. You were talking a little bit about um, the trains and helping the Springfield economy. How about one of those inequities that we can use to our advantage? Everybody knows that the way Congress works, the people that have the most power get a lot more money than the districts that have less power. So do you know, do you think there's any chance that a lot of federal money comes for that train that with a once in a lifetime opportunity, having one of the five most peace powerful people in all of the House of Representatives. Have you talked about that? Is that a possibility? And I mean, I know all your work you're doing in the state has a good chance and it will bear fruit eventually, but this is one of those things where sometimes the federal government, when they're doing a big deal, the people in power get a presence for their district. What are the chances of that happening? I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, other, the other the thing to keep in mind is you've got, you know, you've, you've got Neil in Springfield and then McGovern in Worcester. And uh, Jim McGovern, you know, of course, you know, we, we know Neil's position as chair of Ways and Means, and then Jim McGovern is the chair of the Rules Committee, which is another, you know, incredibly powerful committee. And then, you know, we, we do have a powerful, um, you know, we, we've, got a, we've got an impactful, very effective delegation. You have Catherine Clark in Eastern Mass, who's now in the House leadership. So, um, you know, you, Joe Kennedy is a close ally of, of, uh, of Speaker Pelosi. So you've got um, a lot of opportunity for Massachusetts. And... Um, you know, I can tell you, having worked on the stimulus and the Recovery Act uh, for President Obama um, and being very involved with that and with the debate around that and, um, and kind of watching that all unfold when I was working for David Axelrod, is that, um, you know, the states that took the best advantage of the stimulus money when it was approved were the states that had the shovel-ready projects mm. and had the, um, you know, and had done their own work you know, on the feasibility analysis, and, the, and they, they, they had their own political systems in order so that their legislatures could race through authorizations and their governors were prepared. And so we've, you know, we, we can only control so much federally. You know, we, we, we don't even know if President Trump is going to be open to an infrastructure plan mm -hmm. or what's going to happen, but assuming that that can happen, if we aren't ready with you know our own um, you know our own work <coughs> and prep work to uh, make to you know have that feasibility study done and have East West Rail um, you know be ready to go, um, then then we're going to miss you know you're going to miss exactly exactly the opportunity that you're pointing out because there were states that missed mm -hmm. the stimulus um, in 2009, which was you know it has still been the biggest infrastructure investment. You know, there hasn't been one like that since, and that was almost a decade ago. So, um, so it's just something to keep in mind, which is part of the reason why I do think there's so much urgency to really making sure that the Springfield plan is in order, because I want that feasibility study done so that when the time does come to, to have the federal government, you know, ready to go, we can, we can plop that feasibility study on the desk in D.C. and say, well, we're, we're, we're ready to put, you know, 
10,000 people to work put, building this thing, mm -hmm. you know, here we go. Okay. Um, here and then in the back. Please, sir. Go ahead, babe. Oh, yep. Yep. Uh, in the course of our discussion about infrastructure, what do you see as the importance of developing clean energy infrastructure in this area? Yeah, I mean, it, it's incredibly important. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, it's a frustration I have sometimes that I think a lot of times, you know, the, the environmental discussion and the global warming discussion gets framed in, as a negative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously it's very bad for if, uh, if uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if we all end up underwater. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, um, um, I think we need to challenge ourselves to think about it as a, as a positive, actually, in the sense that this is an opportunity for national mobilization or actually global mobilization mm -hmm. around a common uh, around a common challenge and um, you know there, there, there are a lot of thinkers and people who have been writing about this that I've been kind of consuming recently and uh, and I think that that's an important reframing and so you know to connect the two challenges you know you have an issue of, of, of grossly outdated infrastructure you have a challenge of quite a lot of people who are looking for work or who are underemployed and you have this massive climate crisis looming in the in the really now, I mean, not even in the in the in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so let's put let's mobilize and and do it all at the same time. You know, the 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 rail link between Springfield and Boston would take tens of thousands of cars off the road. It would be one of the single biggest emission. It's one of the single biggest new green New Deal projects Massachusetts could do, um, and it would create jobs and it would help alleviate some of the regional. <coughs> You know inequality that we have as an issue. I'll give you just another example. I filed a bill last week um, around home energy audits, so that you know, and it's controversial. You know, that uh, you know the realtors don't like it, but um, uh, the issue is, is uh, it's like a miles per gallon sticker, but for a house. Mm -hmm. So when you go on Zillow or you go to buy a house, you would know the energy rating, the energy efficiency rating of the house at the time of purchase. So um, the idea here is, is you create a market-driven mechanism to mm -hmm. incentivize weatherization and, up <coughs> and upgrading of homes. Because, of course, a house that has a higher rating will probably get a better price than a, mm -hmm. than a house with a lower rating. So we could literally put thousands of people to work weatherizing, replacing windows, you know, insulating roofs. And by the way, those are the same communities that have been battered by the trade issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is an opportunity. It, you know, it's going to grow the economy, and then you're going to create a more sustainable housing stock. A quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts come from residential buildings. So you can't have any serious <coughs> emissions reduction effort without getting a handle on the residential building sector. And so that's an opportunity. So let's, mm -hmm. let's work with communities, and you know, obviously communities that can't afford it or are lower income, we, you know, we can, we can, we can work on that. We can shift around some of the costs to spread out the opportunity. Another bill I followed with a colleague of mine from Marblehead, Lori Ehrlich, she's a state rep in Marblehead, is, um, and actually it's connected to Baker's initiative around the Transportation Climate Initiative, which is like Reggie, but for auto, the auto and transportation sector. That's going to create a massive new mechanism of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, potential <coughs> revenue sources for the state you know, after we proper after we situate Massachusetts as part of this regional agreement to um, to coordinate transportation emissions, well, let's let's reinvest that in rail, in electric vehicles, in in um, electric infrastructure for trains and and um, and battery charging stations and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you can be creative about this, and 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 if you reframe it, it's actually a huge opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and it's a huge way to um, to grow the economy in the process. I think we have time for two more, so let's take right here and then perhaps you, sir. So you've talked a lot about <coughs> working with the current uh, governor's administration in order to push through, and I know that one of your bills did pass the Massachusetts House and the Massachusetts Senate, uh, but was ultimately vetoed. More than one has been vetoed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> Who's counting? Yes. <laughs> with the most recent elections, um, they both passed with sufficient uh, quantities for a veto override. Do you think that something like that is likely? No, no, tens of thousands tens of cars, thousands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think with the governor's connections to the auto industry that he would ever be likely to sign such a bill? And if so, would a veto override be necessary? Uh, 
All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I think, are you talking about the patent trolling <coughs> legislation that, that got vetoed? or? Um, I was referring directly yeah. to the rail legislation. Oh, the rail, yeah, the feasibility. Yeah, so, I mean, so that was a good example, I actually think, of um, we just didn't really take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't rude about it. We were just insistent. Um, and, uh, and we made the case. You know, we, you know, the, one of the most important things, uh, and this goes back to s sort of the earlier conversation about negotiation, ne negotiating position and negotiation, is one of the most important things is as long as this was viewed as some sort of pet project for Western Mass, it was going to be easy for, mm -hmm. or relatively easy, for the governor or whoever <coughs> to kind of dismiss it. As that's a pork barrel thing. That's a that's a local thing. That's a, you know because every every legislator's got their pet issues and their, um, but and you know and, and uh, Angelo was a big part of this. But uh, you know as soon as we were able to make the case that this isn't for Western Mass, this is for the entire state, and actually the challenges we have are complementary. Western Mass has great quality of life, great cost of living, a lot of open space. We don't have enough jobs. Eastern Mass has plenty of jobs, uh, but has out of control costs, <clears throat> you know, just crazy congestion, housing prices through the roof, nobody can afford to live there. Mm -hmm. Those are complementary challenges. If you build the rail, you help solve the, the Western Mass challenge of access to mm -hmm. jobs, and you help solve the Eastern Mass challenge of nowhere to live, and it's too expensive, and it's too congested. So we r made a really diligent, concerted effort to bring Boston in. Mm -hmm. So we had the Boston Chamber of Commerce. We had a Mass Competitive Partnership, which is a collection of the uh, biggest business organizations in the state. We had um, Eastern Mass legislators uh, that worked with us to make the case. And so now it wasn't just you know us or me or Western Mass saying we need this. It was it was a statewide effort. You know. A, Community, Worcester Chamber of Commerce, Springfield Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, the Boston business community, you know, saying that all of us collectively need this. We got Mass Mutual involved. They have huge operations in Springfield and in Boston. Mm -hmm. They would benefit immensely uh, from this. We got the universities involved. They need a talent. Bay State needs doctors. Mass General has patients that come from Western Mass that miss appointments because they're stuck in traffic, that waste the doctor's time. Because they've got an appointment scheduled and the person is stuck, you know, on you know, in at exit eleven somewhere and can't get in. So <coughs> we, we broadened it out. We mm -hmm. built a you know a broader coalition and we just we just didn't stop. So um, you know that's mm -hmm. that's what you do. Uh, and yeah. uh, and so I think you know the lesson, you know, especially for young people, is um, you're going to get dinged up in the political process and there's going to be a lot of people that that knock you and say it's too ambitious or whatever, um, but you just have to kind of keep at it. And, um, and you got to continually build alliances and build coalitions to, to, to spread out that argument as much as possible. Right. I think that's one of two keys. One, the coalitional piece of this, bringing in as many partners, and then framing and reframing and thinking, right. how do we not just make this a Western Mass pet project, but a much broader kind of deal. Exactly. So can I, we'll just take one more quick question. I'm sensing. I'm, I'm at your mercy. Whenever you <laughs> <So, like. laughs> okay. This is an easy one. Uh, where's the money going to come from? For infrastructure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good. I think that's a good question. <clears throat> There's a lot of wealth in this country, um, and I think that the challenge is is how you, in a sustainable way, reinvest it in constructive ways back into infrastructure, which ultimately grows the whole economy. You know, so um, you know, so we've got to find efficiencies in government. No one, very few people, disagree with that. I've been on the record, you know, supporting some really controversial stuff in my own party, uh, in terms of streamlining and finding more efficiencies so that we can reinvest into our schools and into our infrastructure and into things like, you know, uh, climate uh, uh, climate adaptation. But we've got to adjust our tax policy. You know, we, we, um, we have a tax system that punishes work um, and creates an incentive for people to speculate um, and to not work because our payroll taxes and our, and our, um, and our, and our income tax system is, is, is regressive. 
you know, so you can do things around adjusting to, towards a more progressive income tax system. You can do things around adjusting progressivity and capital gains taxes to capture more of the investment um, and more of the capital gains income that's, you know, growing in the state. Um, and frankly, to lessen the burden on, on working people. Uh, because when you add up gas taxes, payroll taxes, sales taxes, lower income people pay a lot more as a percentage of their overall income than higher income people. And I, I don't think that that's fair. I mean, that, you know, maybe that's controversial. I don't think it's that controversial. Mm -hmm. And I think the next president, the ne I mean, you're seeing now, I mean, when, da when, the, when the convening in Davos is talking about increasing marginal tax rates. <laughs> um, you know, you know, you're seeing a shift. Uh, you know, in the in the in the global conversation. So I think we got to be thoughtful about it. I don't think we want to be. You know, we don't want to be counterproductive. Um, but we've had major changes in the economy and how wealth is accumulated in this country, and our tax system has not caught up with that. So that's you know, in a nutshell, that's how you pay for it. I mean, there's things we can do like the. The TCI, the Transportation Climate Initiative, um, is based off, and this gets a little technical, but it's based off like the REGI credits. It's a, like a kind of cap and trade system for uh, for transportation emissions. So the idea is, is if you want some want less of something, you tax it. So emissions, are, you, know, you don't want emissions. If you want more of something, you subsidize it. Mm -hmm. So we want more people moving to Western Mass. So we'll we'll incentivize and subsidize moving to Western Mass. We want less greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll We'll apply, a, you know, we'll apply a fee to take it to take into account the negative externality of it. So, but you know, I think we've got to make our tax system more progressive, um, and and ultimately that's how you pay for it. Great. So I think we're going to go ahead and leave it there. Um, but uh, let me turn it back over to that. <clears throat> we want to thank Dr. Weiss and uh, Senator Lesser for attending this evening. Uh, I think we've all learned quite a bit and have enjoyed the discussion. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Sid Melker to come up, who is the executive director, as I said before, and she has some something to say and some, some gifts. Gifts for our speakers. <laughs> so you're really lucking out today because if you were speaking speaking at a regular Instant Issues event, you'd get one item, which is a <laughs> oh. prosperity candle from a company oh. up in East wow. Hampton, oh, yeah. Thank which you. uses uh, refugees to create their um, oh. their candles, and they also work with women around the world in conflict zones to become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because you're hey. Miriam Webster, <laughs> <laughs> theirs is bigger, but ours is more sincere. <laughs> um, a nice tote bag um, from Miriam Webster. So thank you, oh. Megan. Thank you. For that. Thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> I would agree with your slogan, by the way. Yeah. Words do matter. <laughs> yeah, let's give Megan a round of applause, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, Mary, Mary Beth touched on this, but I really want to celebrate um, our, our relationship with Miriam Webster. About six years ago, uh, this partnership began um, when we brought about two dozen English teachers in the U.S. under the auspices of the State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program. Um, a very brief version of the story was I emailed Peter Sokolovsky and said, would you be willing to spend like an hour with them and talk about how words get in the dictionary. And he sent back an email and said, can we have them for the day? <laughs> um, since then, I want to say there have been seven projects of English teachers, well over 100 people, and we're going to be bringing another group of about 20 here on March 8th. Um, so that's been an excellent, an excellent partnership. John Morse, our board president, who was unfortunately not be able to hear, wasn't able to be here today, is the retired publisher of Merriam-Webster. Megan is on our board now. Um, we were, well, I wasn't worried, but Megan and John were going back and forth about what this, whether or not this space would be suitable. I think it's an excellent space. Um, so, so thank you very much, Megan and, and Merriam-Webster. And thank you all for coming um, under the threat of, of snow. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Mary Beth said, there are forms out front if you are interested in becoming a member and invitations to our next program in February on Venezuela. Thank wow. you very much, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks.